Surprise! EVGA released the XR1 capture card that they should have released in the first place. Fixing basically all of the issues, but introducing one issue that's gonna be the start of a discussion for capture cards moving forward. I got some stuff to share with you in that regard. Well, we're gonna start with this one. I'm Evil's Vox, the stream professor, and this is the EVGA XR1 Pro. This is the third capture card in the EVGA XR1 line of capture cards. Last year they started with the EVGA XR1, which was a tad bit of a confusing release as the marketing was all based around what they called advanced pass-through, which allowed you to pass through 1440p at 144 Hz, 1080p at 240 Hz, or HDR, but you couldn't capture it. Not, not even just like capture a lower resolution, like when you pass through those formats, it would turn the capture card off, and that was the advanced pass-through, and otherwise it was a basic like 4K60 pass-through 1080p capture with no real PC-friendly support. It had a great headphone amp, and the pass-through for recording your gameplay and things like that for audio through your controller was great, but all of that was really confusing. Now, they turned it around and they kind of fixed some of the marketing on it, and it, it was a really good card. It was just really confusing at launch. And then they released the EVGA XR1 Lite, which is still to this date my favorite budget recommended capture card. It is kind of nothing like this, but it's still a great budget capture card. You can have as low as $45 all the way up to like 60 or 70. Fan like the capture card to buy under 100 bucks. And then they just came out with this one, the Pro model. And this one takes all of that confusing advanced pass-through marketing and just turns it into normal a capture card. So this now competes with the Avermedia Live Gamer Ultra and the Asus Tough CU4K30 that I've covered in the past. This is effectively what they should have launched with in the first place. Who knows what went down in that regard, but it is now quite the capable capture card. Specs-wise, we are looking at up to 4K 60Hz, 1440p 144 hertz or 1080p 240Hz pass-through and HDR pass-through. And this is pass-through that you can record while passing that through. None of this turning the capture card off stuff which is awesome. It captures up to 1440p60, up to 1080p60, or up to 4K30. It only captures in SDR. All HDR that's passed through it is automatically tone mapped to SDR within OBS Studio or your capture app of choice. This is another one that's like OBS certified as the sticker says on the box, which just means they validated that it worked with OBS before selling it, which all capture card companies should do. <laughs> It is a plug and play UVC capture card. We'll talk about more UVC stuff in a moment, but it is plug and play and it distributes uncompressed video to your system. So that means NV12, which is 420 chroma subsampling, which just means it's color compressed, but it's not data compressed. So there's not gonna be artifacting or anything like that at 1440p60 or 4K30. And then you have YUI2, which is 422 chroma subsampling, which just means text and things like that. It's gonna look better if you zoom in like 500% or something. YUI2 is available at 1080p. YUI2 is listed at 1440p. However, like most capture cards we've reviewed in terms of USB models, it will only capture about 50 or 55 FPS in this mode as verifiable in virtual dub. However, there's a secret capability of this capture card, a secret feature or issue. I'm not sure how to categorize it at the moment. This card will technically pass through G-Sync compatibility or Adaptive Sync. It's not supposed to. I'm pretty sure this is a bug. I've been communicating with the EVGA about this and they will probably release a firmware update that disables this. But out of the box by default, if you plug this in with a G-Sync compatible monitor or, you know, FreeSync and graphics card that supports it, plug it in through pass-through, it will enable it by default. Before you cheer, before you talk about how awesome that is, because there, are, we'll talk about it, but you don't want this. If you use this capture card with pass-through, you need to go into your NVIDIA control panel or AMD control panel and disable Adaptive Sync. You don't want it. While it's cool to have no tearing on your screen, it completely mucks up the capture. It completely screws it up. Frame pacing is all over the place. I kind of got freaked out because I was trying to get this review out for launch, but I was delayed in actually testing it and things like that. And all of my original test captures were stuttery as hell and looking through them there were duplicate frames all over the place and the frame pacing was just terrible and I couldn't figure out why I was testing on different systems finally sent an email to my EVGA guy I was like look man something's not right here here's what I've tested had another whack at it the next day and discovered G-Sync was turned on I was actually checking G-Sync to see if it was turned on on the secondary monitor in case that was somehow interfering because it happens but no it was turned on for the pass through of this capture card which means, I, I didn't notice because it wasn't there, but like, 
I wasn't getting any tearing on my screen. Pacing was horrible, even for games that were running at a locked 120 FPS or running above 60 FPS. I thought it was like sampling poorly from 144 hertz or whatever. It just was really messing up the capture. So this is like a secret feature, but also something you want to turn off right away. It's kind of cool that it exists, but it's going to really make your frame pacing bad. With G-Sync turned off, the capture looks look great. They're paced correctly. It's a smooth 60 FPS. Now, the cool thing with this is you can pass through 4K 60, say from a game console, and capture or stream in 1080p or 720p or whatever. You can also capture or stream in 1440p if you so desire. Or you can pass through 1440p. So I test it with PC, Xbox, etc. Looks great, plays great, sounds great. It has the headphone amp built on board, so it has a four-pole headset pass-through and then a or a headset connection and then a pass-through to connect to your controller. So you can connect it to your controller to pass through party chat and hear your game sound that way or whatever. That feature is awesome as well. Physically, you still have the shiny fingerprint magnet uh, chroma top here with the RGB lighting. I left the protective film on this time just because we've already talked about most of this. You control the audio settings and the pass-through volume and stuff with this little dial in the middle. You can refer to my original XR1 review for all of those details, uh, but pretty neat regardless. In terms of what it can do, it is a UVC capture card, as I mentioned at the start of this video. This means it uses a built-in kind of plug-and-play class of drivers that are just built into your operating system, and it functions basically as a webcam, which means it'll be detected in video calling apps or video conferencing apps. It also means it works out of the box on Mac and most likely Linux. I can't test it at this exact moment. I feel fairly confident given the previous EVGA cards also did. Works great on Linux. In terms of latency, preview latency. This is the latency of the video signal coming in and displaying to the OBS preview. Uh, we're looking at a latency about 58 milliseconds, which is incredibly fast for a USB capture card. So huge kudos to EVGA there. That means that if you want to play off the preview, you're still probably going to have a terrible time for most games, but it's one of the better options out there for a USB capture card, and it means that syncing it up with your audio is not going to be a problem at all. So huge kudos for that. You know what else I have huge kudos for? Today's sponsor. This video is brought to you by Riverside.fm, my new favorite podcast and video recording platform and what I will be using for future episodes of my Behind the Streams podcast. Riverside.fm is used by Gary V, Guy Raz, Spotify, Disney, and many more creators. It records audio and video locally on each participant's device and uploads these local files automatically to the Riverside dashboard. And oh man, the recordings look like they came straight out of camera, which is bonkers and a huge step up from what I was previously using. No more coordinating recording with your guests or anything like that as it's all really done for them. You can receive separate audio in uncompressed 48 kilohertz wave and video up to 4K tracks for all participants. And by all, I mean all, up to eight co-hosts or guests are allowed, which is wild. Riverside uses progressive uploading so that it uploads while the show goes on so you can download your files within seconds of hitting stop record. With the Magic Editor, you can save hours of editing work with a few clicks. Change your size, positioning, backgrounds, layouts, add a logo, and more. Plus, you can export the video ready to upload to video sites and download a transcription in seconds as well. Guests can even join from iPad and iPhone too. Did I forget to mention the cool part? Riverside FM is also a streaming tool, meaning that while you're recording, you can also live stream to most major platforms, which is pretty neat. But streaming does not get in the way of recording. It is a recording first platform with quality as its focus, which I can really appreciate. Plans start from just $7.50 per month. Go to riverside.fm slash eposfox and use code eposfox to get $15 off a plan today. In terms of retro captures and formats, this thing's pretty impressive. With the open source scan converter running the Super Nintendo, which has an odd refresh rate and causes compatibility issues, it worked all the way up to the 4X scale. Unfortunately, the 5X just says not compatible no matter what mode I put the capture card in. I could not get a signal from it. However, the RetroTINK 5X supports all modes, including 1440p, which is actually very not common. So that is nice to see. It is most likely not going to work in a native 4x3 like the 1920 by 1440 mode but it will read it in 2560 by 1440 and you just apply a filter in OBS to squish it back to 4x3 which is fine. There was one issue I wanted to mention that was consistently come up that I do have EVGA looking into but I did want to bring up separate from the G-Sync thing and that is with an audio desync issue I had. I can regularly replicate an issue where specifically I tested it with the Xbox Series X or Series S but theoretically what happened with anything where if you change the refresh rate that you are sending to it while it's active in OBS and then just try to capture, your audio is going to be severely desynced. <laughs> 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 
However, the easy fix is if you do that, then you just hit deactivate and reactivate for the source in OBS Studio, and this fixes it. So not an issue overall, just wanted to let you know if you encounter that. I specifically encountered it because I was toggling between 60 hertz and 120 hertz for pass through on the capture card on the Xbox. And whenever I switched it while it was already, you know, active, I would get audio desync. So that issue is there. And otherwise, the G-Sync thing is weird. The reason I wanted to expand it out to a bigger conversation is there actually is a capture card on the market right now that is supposed to support adaptive sync. It is from a company called Pingo. I've been testing it off and on. You know, I can only spend so much time at it at certain points, but like I've been testing it and have continued to have issues and issues with it. So I'm working with them to fine tune the firmware and find the right configuration. Cause literally it's not even like it's not a great experience. Like it just doesn't work in my experience. Uh, so I'm still working with them on getting it to work, but we're going to eventually see adaptive sync capture card supported on the market. And that will be crucial once we approach HDMI 2.1 coming in. So there's a lot to be had in that regard, but this is kind of a tease for that because you can technically pass through adaptive sync. Your captures are just going to be terrible. So product links as always will be in the description below for this capture card. If you want to check it out, I do hope you enjoyed today's review. If you want to go, you know, chat with us about it, you can do so over on Discord, discord.gg slash epostvox. And as always, remember, be kind, rewind.